Greetings and blessings, you guys, and welcome to our online healing service this Sunday evening. I am Apostle Marquita Brooks. I lead the invitation movement, um, and I'm also the, the founder and ministry leader of the Truth and the Spirit, the ministry that oversees the invitation movement. And I am excited and blessed to be with you guys this evening um, as we kind of come into um, MLK Day, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday celebration, the holiday um, on which we remember the legacy of not just Dr. King, but all of those who sacrificed in the civil rights movement. And we are reminded of the model that was set before us, a model that we seem to have forgotten, a model that we've certainly strayed from. Um, but the Lord is calling us back to the foundation that he laid through so many who came before us, who sacrificed and, and, and died uh, for the cause of freedom, equality, justice, and unity. And I shared a message yesterday during our Shabbat temple service um, titled, Have We Forgotten the Dream? And in that message, I shared uh, the, the history that shows how it was not just African-Americans who were a part of the civil rights movement. It would not have been successful without everybody in the body of believers coming together. I wanna share some of those pictures with you guys tonight so that you'll be reminded this is absolutely a work that we've got to do as one in a place of oneness, but also to call you to really do exactly what tonight's topic is, continuing the work of Dr. King. We've got to continue Dr. King's work. We have diverted and, and turned from the model and the ways and even the spirit behind it, which was the Holy Spirit. And we've allowed so many other things to come into our nation, into the body of believers, into our own fellowship with one another. So many divisions, so many things that are just uh, causing us to grieve the Holy Spirit and, and further divide the nation rather than actually being in the position that the Lord would have us to be in to be leaders in this nation. And so we want to pray and we want to go into worship, which will be led by uh, Lawrence and Jasmine Nichols. Then we're going to have a report out by Elder Tamise Willis, who's going to talk on that same topic, continuing the work of Dr. King. And then I'll give an exhortation again on that same topic, because this is absolutely what we have to do. This is the season. And honestly, we, if we don't get back into position now and continue the work according to the model and with the same spirit that we saw exemplified before us half a century ago, we could really destroy our own nation from within. And so we've got to be sure that we are connecting with God and we are aligning with the, with the mission that he has given us and continuing the work that has already begun in the way that God would have us to do it. So let us pray. Father, we lift you up and we worship you, Lord God, and we just praise you even now for being born into a generation that has a model and a legacy that was left for us, Lord. We thank you for being born into a generation that has come into a time where the technology and the resources allow us to reach people across the airwaves, across the miles, even in the midst of a pandemic, Lord God, you are expanding your reach as you allow us to connect with each other in, in various ways. You're, you're teaching us to be resourceful and to, to be flexible, with, to adapt with you and move with you that your work would still be done no matter what is happening. Forgive us, Lord God, for our flesh has shown up. We've allowed the enemy to draw us into ideological and political camps, to separate us from each other, to, to keep us from being salt and light as you ordained for us to be. Forgive us, Lord God, for not being faithful to the call and for not being those that, that demonstrate your character and exemplify uh, the power and the love of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask even now in this healing service that you would touch our hearts, Lord God. Bring us back into alignment first with you, but then also that you would allow us to connect again with each other. We praise you for your great grace and your goodness even now. We invite you to have your way in this healing service. Move by the power of your spirit, Lord God, and use us in accordance with your will. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen and amen. And so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Lawrence and Jasmine Nichols, who are going to lead us in worship.
services, but this is exactly what each individual and the nation needs, and it's exactly what the nation needs as a whole to come into the refreshing, healing presence of God in worship. There's so many emotions, so many mindsets and thoughts and 
and all of these things that's just fighting for our attention. But in worship, the Lord settles the waters. And worship, the Lord ministers to our hearts and he makes it well with our soul as he reminds us that he's still on the throne, that nothing has surprised him. Nothing even has offended him. Instead, the Lord is doing exactly what he knows needs to be done as he has already worked all of this into his perfect plan. The question is, are we going to meet him where he's working? Are we going to accept that invitation to connect with, with where God is already at work? Or are we going to do what we feel and think is best? Are we going to be swayed by emotions and agendas and political parties and, and, and movements and, and all types of things come to divide and, and really disrupt what God himself is doing in this nation. It is time for us to shift. 20, if 2020 didn't let us know, 2021 has already made it clear. We have got to shift. And the Lord is taking us back to something he himself established, something he himself did, which is the work that we saw, of course, and um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and so many others that were part of the civil rights movement. And so I'd actually like to start us off by um, handing it over to Elder Tamise Willis. She is going to give a report out concerning um, continuing the work of Dr. King, sharing what's on her heart and some things that the Lord has revealed to her over the years. And then I'll come back and do an exhortation on this same topic. And so Elder Tamise, I'm going to hand it over to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, um, I just I bless Father. Hallelujah for just this, this moment in time, because it is a Kairos moment, as you said earlier today. This is a moment that we have that we will never have an opportunity to have again, because the, the grounds are prepped for the appointed time that the Lord has released. And so I, I want to first uh, just bless Abba, you know, for this opportunity, but also thank you as well, uh, the in invitation movement team, um, for inviting me here uh, this evening. And uh, just as the worship went forth today, it spoke volumes. Just um, the the verse that was repeated was, "You are beautiful in all of your ways. You're beautiful in all of your ways." And I I couldn't help but to think about just the just a variation of 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 um uh of identities that the lord has created in his people um just throughout the earth you know uh black white yellow red just just all of us having a piece of of an identity of the image of god coming together but the lord has spoke identity into each of us and tonight he wants to talk about um what he is he's doing in um the african americans within this nation, um, uh, namely through uh, what Dr. Martin Luther King, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King has done um, in leading us, you know, um, forward in uh, the inheritance of, of the Lord. And so uh, as I was preparing for tonight, all I could help to think about is um, just a number of things that have helped to prepare me for this moment. It, my great grandmother, you know, um, those who have come before me, um, those, you know, of course, Dr. Martin Luther King, but also um, my, I remember my grandmother used to sing a song. Um, she used to sing a song, I Need Thee. And it, it goes a little like this. Um, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Let me now, my Savior, I come to thee. And I remember she used to sing that song, my great grandmother, she is no longer with us here. She is amongst the cloud of witnesses. But that song gave me a piece of inheritance because, um, you know, growing up, we, you know, I, I went to, um, I'm from New Jersey originally, and uh, we had, you know, lots of uh, things, especially surrounding Black History Month, um, where, you know, there were events and plays where we put on certain things. And, um, you know, uh, growing up in, in high school, um, I went to um, a, a high school called St. Anthony's um, 
Catholic school actually in, in Jersey City, New Jersey. Um, it was a, a well-known school, mainly known for sports and things of that nature. But one of the things we sung just even throughout the city was the, the national anthem, the black national anthem. And I remember that resounding with me. But you know, growing up, I, I always felt that there was something missing. And then when I went to college, um, I went to college actually um, uh, completely out of uh, my zone, uh, went all the way up to, the, to Virginia, came to Virginia and then went to the other side of Virginia, which is about eight hours from here. And I um, and, uh, went to uh, Clinch Valley College, the University of Virginia's College at Wise and was amongst the minority there. But even then, uh, just today, I was reminded of um, people who instilled in me um, just to be reminded of who God has created me to be, you know, as a, as a Black um, um, African-American uh, woman. And uh, this, was, this was difficult growing up because uh, we didn't talk much about this in my family. I mean, we, we are a mixed breed, you know, as, as Apostle will probably talk about today, I, mixed with a number of things. You name it, I have it in me. And uh, there, there was something that was missing. And so we, when I had an opportunity to go to Israel in 2011, and uh, prior to that, um, I'll, I'll say very briefly, um, I was called to go to Israel. I was absolutely called. Uh, I uh, attend a uh, church called War Outreach Worship Center. I'm a member there. And um, God even sent me there. He called me there um, and he called me to Israel. And I remember uh, sitting at a friend's house one day, a group of friends who came in uh, for about three months and then they were gone. Um, they came in and uh, guy said, you know, um, it was a married couple. And, uh, one of the um, couple's uh, individual said, you know, you got to listen to the song. You got to listen to the song. And the name of it was Kadosh. So he played the song. And as I listened to the song and Kadosh means holy in Hebrew, as I listened to this song, this song began to resonate in me. And it was as if I knew the words, but I didn't know the words. Um, beautiful song. If you have a chance to look it up, it's actually in a road to Jerusalem CD. And uh, this song helped to, to connect everything um, that I was missing, um, everything that, um, all the pieces that were just kind of floating around, you know, that made me peculiar. Um, they seem to come together in this song um, and in the God of Israel, really, because it is him who called me. But this song, he knew what drew me because I, I'm a worshiper. And he knew that the song would draw me to him to seek him out. You know, um, you know, as it says in, in Proverbs, um, the kings will seek him out. And so that's what I began to do. And uh, as that happened, he then called me to Israel. I, I kid you not, it was probably less than a year later. He said, you need to go to Israel. Um, when I heard the song, I said, well, how do I do that? <laughs> and so I was going I going to this congregation and um, the, the, the rabbi of this congregation, they had just come back. And then I think I met Apostle Marquita a couple of years before, um, didn't know much about uh, what was going on. She came there for Ecclesia Wild Sea. And I got it. I just so happened to get an email from her. I just so happened to get an email from her right in that time and space, you know, where the Lord was was calling me to Israel. So uh, I've had an opportunity, I'm uh, happy to say, to go several times. And each time, uh, it has been a blessing. Uh, the first time I was a blank slate, just exactly what the Lord wants us to be so he can write, you know, his, his words on our heart, you know, as we are, um, we're being grafted back into the olive tree. Um, but I will tell you this, there was one particular time, um, that we went, I think it was the first time. And uh, we were told a story about the bottomless cup. And I actually have this cup with me. Um, we were told this story about the bottomless cup. And we as African-Americans, we are passionate people. We are passionate people, but without the Lord, without the healing that we need in our souls, we are wanderers. We don't know what to do with the passion. We, 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 we just continue to wander. And it, I'm telling you from my own experience, I, I, I was able to take all of what the Lord put inside of me um, as a worshiper, as just being who he's called me to be, all of the identities he's given me as tools and things of that nature. And it all seemed to make sense when I came to his feet, when I recognized him for who he was, when I answered the call. This um, story of the cup, the bottomless cup, we actually heard when we were in Israel the first time. And uh, the story, um, I remember bits and pieces of it, but the, the summation of it is never put down the cup. 
those who the Lord has called, what he has called you to be, never put down the cup. And you see that this doesn't have a bottom. And so the only way for it not to topple over if there's there's a drink in it that, that comes from our love, you know, Yeshua, is to hold the cup, to, to be the bearer of the cup, to be the steward of the cup. And so um, this was one thing that um, some of our friends in, 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 in Jerusalem, they actually ministered to us as they gave us, uh, uh, ministered to us to, to pick up the baton of uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, which was, uh, you know, when he was assassinated, it was as if that baton was dropped and no one picked it up in the, the integrity that the Lord had given him which was to really bring Jews and Gentiles together. If you guys study his story, it was to bring Jews and Gentiles together. He was actually scheduled to um, bring a, a huge choir to Israel, parts of Jordan, and um, uh, serve as a witness just to Israelis, you know, that the Lord really wants to do this thing. He wants one new man amongst us. And, and sadly, you know, he was assassinated um, thereafter. And so the Lord is asking us, he is, he is, pardoning us. He's, he's inviting us to um, share in this cup that he has given us, share in the cup. Now we cannot share in the cup that he's given us to bring um, Jew and Gentile together, or even, you know, love ourselves if we don't love him. If we, we haven't accepted the fact that yes, we have been in slavery in the past for 400 years. And there's a deep pain associated with that. Oh my goodness. There is such a deep pain there. And each of us have to address that pain. Each of us. Um, have to absolutely address that pain. Um, and it's going to take, the Lord is going to take the, just the, the truth of who he is. It's going to take one another, um, us reconciling with one another, us repenting to one another, us um, uh, receiving forgiveness from one another in order to, to hold the cup that he has given us to hold. Because each of us have um, an inheritance that he's given us. Each of us absolutely have an inheritance that he has given us. And so as we move forward today, we have to ask ourselves, are we going to accept the cup, you know, that the Lord has given us? Surely when he comes, he returns. Uh, there's, there's a cup even now that Yeshua, he refuses to drink until he returns because he knows there is work to do amongst us and in us. And he's waiting for us. He is waiting for an opportunity to, to actually do the work inside of us because we need it. We absolutely need it with, with all of what's happening in the world today. A lot of it is signs and, you know, things that are coming up from just a wound that has been there for 400 years, 400 years. And so I want to encourage you, you know, to seek the Lord out while he may be found. Um, I'll share with you one other thing. When I heard uh, the voice of the Lord, this was he uh, my heart was called to him in 2004. I was actually going over that with him today. It was uh, June 4th, 2004, actually. <laughs> And uh, it was a, a miraculous um, salvation, how he saved me, uh, just beautiful thing. But I remember months after, and, and, and if I had to summarize just everything that I've said so far, I would say this is probably the most important thing. Um, one thing that the Lord, uh, he, he did was I, I started hearing his voice um, maybe months after, you know, um, I, I gave my life to him and, and, and I stopped running from him and, um, you know, and just ran into his arms. And I remember him saying, you know, um, I was driving from a congregation one day and I remember him saying, pull over at the next dumpster and I want you to throw away all of your music, all of your CDs. And I had lots of secular CDs because like I said, I love music. I'm a worshiper. And I was like, I can hear you, Lord, <laughs> you know, so, but I knew that if I did not hear, heed his voice, that I, I would never have that opportunity again. I would never have that opportunity. So, and I was a baby Christian. So I listened, I, I pulled over at the dumpster and I threw away all the CDs. He said he would replace all of it and none of that mattered. But here's the point I'm making. God's voice is more important than anything. And it, it's intensified as we come closer to who Yeshua really is, it, it is intensified. And we, we need that in this time. We need to know who we are in him. We need to know our purpose in him. We need to know his character. And all these things come, they come over time, but we have to absolutely hear his voice, but we can't get that unless we move ourselves out of the way. And so that means we gotta deal with the identity um, 
the theft of the identity. We have to deal with the, 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 the orphanhood that has been inside of us. We have to absolutely deal with that. We have to build, deal with the slavery um, that we see. We have to deal with what our eyes see and our ears see every day. Um, and it has to be reconciled. It has to have a place. It has to find a place and it has a place. It is on the cross in Yeshua. He already took it, but we have to give it to him. When we give it to him, we can then have the freedom to carry the cup. We won't feel a burden to carry the cup and we'll know what to do with the passion that he's given us as a people when we carry the cup because the cup is ours, whether we want it or not. The question is, will we carry the cup that he's given us? Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing that. This is so important as we look at continuing Dr. King's work because that there's this very specific cup that has been passed to us in this generation. And honestly, if it passes from us, it will spill over. There's not a plan B for us. This is the season. This is the moment. We've got to say yes. You know, the Lord has brought us to royal position for such a time as this. There's something he's doing in us that he would like to use to, to make some shifts and make a difference in this nation. However, as Elder Smith was saying, we can't do it out of brokenness, out of bitterness, out of resentment. We can't do it being uh, pulled into our divisive corners, um, into the, these constructs of man that limit us, that really tell us how much we can serve God. So, you know, if, if you're with this group, then you can support Israel and you can stand against perversion and, and an abortion, but you can't um, also care for the poor and you can't also care about the cause of the immigrant and you, because you, you have to be with this group if you feel that way and that's the enemy that's not kingdom because god cares about everything and everyone and he cares about us with such a deep and passionate love that he wants to actually give us that love that we would address the challenges we see in our nation through that very thing we cannot do this without love we cannot do this without coming together in unity and so i want to continue in that topic continuing the work of Dr. King that, that Elder Tamis began and really share some important revelation for you guys as we move forward. Um, on one of those trips to Israel, as Elder Tamis was just, um, uh, she, she briefly shared with you guys, um, um, uh, uh, leaders of a Messianic ministry that were very close to, uh, the same leaders I was referring to when I talked about the Joseph anointing. Um, not only did they minister to us about the Joseph anointing, they always ministered to us, they minister a lot to us. Um, one thing that they have consistently ministered to us um, since probably the first time I've gone to Israel. I've been in Israel eight times, and almost every time I go, this comes back up again um, because we see them almost every time we go. At least I see them almost every time I go. And when I take a group, I always take a group to see them. They always mention that we are being called to continue the work of Dr. King. And this is important coming from Israel, because as Elder Smith was, was beginning to share with you guys, uh, just before Dr. King was assassinated, he was planning a trip to Israel. He was planning to bring um, a large group of Americans, predominantly African-American, but not only African-American, um, to Israel. And he said specifically that he was first and foremost a minister of the gospel. We've actually got the letters that he sent out on letterhead. We've got... Um, articles that were printed in a newspaper about this trip to Israel that he was going to take and in the, the Americans that he was going to take with him, the fact that he had actually received um, clearance from not just the Israeli government, but the Jordanian government to actually visit all of the holy sites because those holy sites are, are split between the contemporary state of Israel and the contemporary state of Jordan. All of that actually used to be the Solomonic kingdom of Israel. And so you've got biblical places in both nations. And so Dr. King actually had received um, clearance from both nations to share this revelation um, of, of, of Messiah, but they had allowed him to come because they know he was a man of peace. The point is, Israel and Jordan was actually having challenges at that time, and he was coming, and they knew that there was an anointing on him for peace. Prior to him coming, the Six-Day War broke out between Israel and Jordan, and when that happened, Dr. King, of course, not wanting anyone to be harmed because people had certainly uh, sacrificed themselves for the cause of peace so much. And he'd seen so much death, so much destruction. At this point, Dr. King was not wanting more of that to go forward. And so he he postponed. In his mind, he was, he was going to postpone. This is what was in his heart, to 
to postpone this trip to Israel. But we know, of course, what happened the following year, Dr. King was assassinated. And so at the time that he was assassinated, he then was not able to continue this work um, to bring uh, believers into Israel and into Jordan with this heart of peace. But know this, he was not coming just to, well, you know, we're the Americans and we're going to bring what you guys need to receive from us. That was not the heart of Dr. King at all. He had been to Israel himself and he knew what a tremendous blessing it was to be there, to receive from the land, to walk where our Messiah had walked. Um, he knew it was a blessing and he wanted to bring other believers to partake in it. He wanted to bring other believers who would be blessed um, by this experience. And so his, his trip was not just that he believed God was going to pour out from him into these two nations, being the, the, the peacekeeper, the peacemaker that he is, but he also believed very fervently that the, the, the believers coming from the United States were going to receive so many blessings from being a part, being partakers of really this rich history, this beauty that is in Israel. Dr. King was a lover of Israel. And, and, and being a lover of Israel, he understood that to, to be a Zionist, to be one who loves Israel, who, who believes that Israel should be in the land. See, that's the big deal. Does Israel have the right to be in the land? To, he, he understood to support that truth meant to support the Bible because he understood and he believed the promises of the Bible. So that caused Dr. King to see his, God's people Israel through the eyes of God. He saw them the way God saw Israel, and he saw the times that he was in as very important times, that these times were times where, where people were, were, were really going to see something they had never seen before if they would really just allow God to lead them, if they would allow God to minister to them, if they would allow God to use them, that they would see things that they had never before seen. And so he was, was really a, a, a pioneer, and so many others, believe me, I'm, I'm certainly not... Um, downplaying anyone else that was involved in the civil rights movement because so many people sacrificed, lost their lives, died. Like there was so uh, much giving, so much, so much of an offering that had to come forward for us to experience the freedoms that we experience today, not just as African-Americans, but as Americans. Because as I shared in my sermon yesterday, um, have we forgotten the dream? You know, Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And what we know is that if any segment of this nation is, is in bondage, is in a position where they are not able to, to be who God has ordained them to be, then that means that the nation itself is not fulfilling its purpose. It means that the nation itself is in bondage because God designed this nation out of all the people groups that he allowed to come to these shores. No matter how we got here, God designed the nation out of a, a, a bringing together of all of these many people groups. In my sermon yesterday, I actually quote Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 21, where the Lord says that he will provoke Israel to jealousy by a people who were not a people, a people with no sense. That speaks of Gentiles who come from various people groups who are not one people group. He brings them all together. They don't know the ways of God, but then they start to demonstrate the ways of God. So first and foremost, that's the body of believers, the global body of believers, which is Jew and Gentile, one and Messiah, who most of whom don't know the ways of God being gentiles meaning it didn't it wasn't passed down it's not ancestral like it was of course for god's people israel um but as we come together the holy spirit just breathes life into us and we demonstrate this knowledge of that which god is still teaching us yeah. but you see also in deuteronomy chapter 32 21 the way god speaks of it there's only one nation that has ever existed that really sounds like what he's saying a nation that is made up of peoples who were not one people, but now are one people, are an American people, right? We're one people who can provoke Israel to jealousy. The modern state of Israel is actually designed and modeled after the United States. Of course, they've got their ancient models of Israel. They've got their biblical models before them. But when it came to contemporary things, when you go to Israel, you're going to see that almost every sign is in Hebrew, Arabic, and English. You're going to see American flags all over the hotels, um, at the restaurants, like just about everybody speaks English. Um, there is this, this acceptance and this love of American culture. Like I, I saw you, you know, blasting hip hops with, with the pants on the hips. 
in Israel. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> I know you got that from. <laughs> Don't get that from us. <laughs> you know, but it's it, you see America all over Israel, and there's this beautiful welcoming of the United States there because there's a, a, an allegiance that the Lord has created with us. And I and I mentioned that. Not to say that we should only be in alignment with, you know, America should only be in agreement with Israel or, or, or Israel is our only focus. But Israel is the first focus because the reality is if our hearts are right toward Israel, our hearts will be right toward everybody else. Because those are the first two distinct groups that you see in the Bible are God's people, Israel and the Gentiles. We come up with additional distinctions as you go throughout human history. But initially, these are the distinctions that the Lord makes. His set apart people who are supposed to be a light to everybody else. And then those people that he would raise up out of the everybody else that would then provoke his people Israel to jealousy. Like these are the two groups. But out of the two groups, the Lord has always desired to make one people. One people that are his people. He's always desired to do it. And that's the very thing that the body of believers should be demonstrating so that God's vision for America could actually come to pass. This is so important because Dr. King, we, we, we understand about his marches on Washington and we understand um, about his fights for uh, justice for African-Americans. We understand about his fights for, for economic um, uh, equity and 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 and. and, and and provision for the poor. He fought for the rights of the poor and for, you know, things, barriers that were there um, to be removed, that people might be able to pursue life, liberty, and, and, and the pursuit of happiness. They might be able to, to live uh, that American dream in America. Like, we know about that fight, but most of us don't know about his fight for Israel. Most of us don't know about his stance against those who were anti-Semitic. Most of us don't know about the fact that he really had no tolerance for the hatred and the bigotry that we see not just against African Americans, but against Jews, against Israel, and against other people groups as well. His, his um, stance was a very consistent stance. It did not just apply to those who looked like him. And he did not just enlist those who looked like him. Yeah. He understood that it would take all of so there's a few things that I want to share with you guys so that you'll really understand where Dr. King's heart was at this time and in this season. I want to take you to some, um, some pictures that I shared during, um, during my sermon yesterday. And you can find that sermon, um, Have We Forgotten the Dream, on the Truth and the Spirit's YouTube page or YouTube channel, which is Truth and Spirit Live, all one word. But it is also on the Truth and Spirit's Facebook page, which is also Truth and Spirit Live. It's on the Invitation Movement's Facebook page. It's on my personal Facebook page, Marquita Brooks. Just look for the Shabbat Temple service titled, Have We Forgotten the Dream? And you can listen to the entire sermon. Um, but I'm going to give you just a little bit of, of it right now because we've got to understand the importance of continuing the work of Dr. King in the spirit that God gave him. And so I'm going to take you to the PowerPoint that I used during yesterday's sermon. And what you'll see here, this first picture that you're going to see, is Dr. King with a Catholic priest. You see that? There's a priest with him holding his kids' hands. You know, it's Dr. King's hands. There's sister, sister Coretta right there. Um, and you see that they're all singing together. This is a dream. Remember, at the end of his I Have a Dream speech, his dream was that we would all come together, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, black and white, singing the words of that Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. They're all singing together. And you see, this is a picture. It's not just about coming across racial lines and just being Americans. This is a picture of the body of believers. Mm -hmm. So then you're going to see the next picture. I love this picture where you see these nuns, but they look like, like, honestly, you see, there's some guys behind them and the guys look a little bit nervous. You see the guys' faces? The guys look a little bit nervous. Like, man, we're about to go into some stuff. Those nuns look like, bring it on. Let's go. Like they were ready for whatever was about to go. Anybody who's ever been in any type of Catholic training know, you know, the nuns don't play. And they were ready to walk in that fiery anointing of God to stand against injustice that was being experienced by African American people. But they understood that it was an injustice that was that was really an affront against America, against the body of believers. And so you see them coming and joining the movement. Then there's an additional picture. This picture is a very famous picture where you see Dr. King with, with, the, with an archbishop from the um, Greek Orthodox Church. A picture of Dr. King and this archbishop actually made the cover of Time magazine. And many people believe that this was a big uh, turning point in the civil rights movement because this wasn't just any minister. This was an, uh, an archbishop 
of, of the Greek Orthodox Church so that when he came into the movement and he said, I'm standing in this civil rights movement with Dr. King and so many others, his church came with him. I'm talking about the, the, the global Greek Orthodox Church came and supported with him. And so it was, a, it was a great show of solidarity, again, in the body of believers. This is a show of solidarity among believers to stand against injustice. Now, this last picture that I want to show you guys, I love this one. It's one that I often post on MLK Day because, again, it brings us right back to the importance of the connection between Israel and the body of believers. So this is going to be prior to the, the, the Messianic movement being birthed in the 70s. OK, so these are not believing Jews. These are rabbis from conservative reform or even orthodox synagogues that are that are with him. You see the capote on their head. You see the Torah there. These are, are rabbis marching with Dr. King. And, and I want to tell you a historical reference that I learned actually in St. Augustine from Jews. The largest group of rabbis to ever be arrested at one time in history happened in St. Augustine, Florida, where 16 rabbis were arrested for marching with Dr. King. And, and to understand the, the importance of what I'm sharing here helps you to really realize the magnitude of the fact that when Dr. King went forward in the civil rights movement, not al allowing himself to be emotional, not allowing his words, his actions to be divisive, instead choosing to actually call out to God's people all over the nation and all over the world saying, You've got to join us in this fight. We cannot do this without you. We, we will not be successful in this fight without you. Priests, nuns, archbishops, and rabbis showed up. And they showed up in mass. They showed up in numbers. They showed up sacrificing. This is the body of believers. But it wasn't just them. It was college students. It was working moms and, 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 and dads. It was citizens from all over the country. But I'm showing you these pictures of leaders that you would understand that we came together at this period of time from all types of different backgrounds and nominations, all types of different observances of our worship of our God, but we came together and this is why it was successful. And this does not happen when there is resentful, bitter and divisive rhetoric coming out of our mouth. This right here, what you see in these pictures, it doesn't happen. What you have to uh, exude and what you have to walk in is love and peace for this type of unity to happen. And that's why it became successful. And this is why when we went to Israel, we were told that we had to pick up the drop baton of, of Dr. King because there were so many others that continued in the civil rights movement. We celebrated them even unto recently. We've been celebrating those same leaders who continued in the work of Dr. King, in the beautiful sacrificial work of Dr. King. But we saw that other groups rose up as well. From among the African-American community, other groups rose up. Black nationalist groups and, and more militant groups. And these groups were polarizing. They, they, they served the African-American communities. They were all about security and protection for African-American communities. But you could hear in speeches and in, 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 in the, 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 the rhetoric that came forward that there was a divisive message, that there was a, a resentment and a bitterness that had not been addressed in those groups. And there were groups that did not welcome and, and would not uh, bring together all types of people. It was not possible because their goal was really to kind of circle the, rag the wagons around African-American communities. That was really the goal, not a goal of unity, not a goal of bringing people all together. So you see the Nation of Islam rising up at that time, having a very strong voice as Dr. King passes away. You see the Black Panthers rising up at that time, again, having a very strong voice, operating in the political realm, in the community realm, doing lots of things for African-Americans, but neither of those groups were focused on national unity as Dr. King was. Neither of those groups had a heart for national unity and neither of those groups had a love for Israel. Instead, what you'll find at their core is them identifying Israel and the Jew as being the white man behind the white man, spouting even more divisive and, and hateful rhetoric into a community that was already so broken and so divided. It would not have been possible for the beautiful things that we saw happen 50 years ago in the civil rights movement to happen without Jews, without Catholics, without whites, without Native Americans, without Hispanics, without Asians. It would not have been possible if the American populace had not come together. We saw Dr. King in the forefront. We saw so many others 
who were at the forefront even lost their lives in the African-American community, but they weren't the only ones who lost their lives. Jews were killed, whites were killed, priests were killed, rabbis were jailed, uh, Jewish students were killed, Native Americans were killed. Like literally there were so many others that sacrificed, so many others that were fully committed to the cause because they understood that the dream was all about us being one family. Anything that's not going to espouse that dream is going to destroy us as a nation because no one group in this nation can survive without the other groups. The Lord has designed this nation such that we absolutely must cooperate or we self-destruct. And that's what you're going to see happening right now. We do have African Americans rising up right now who are upset and inflamed and even having some, some, some um, influence in the political realm and, and operating in the social realm. But we don't hear a message of unity and peace. And we certainly don't hear a message of standing with Israel in accordance with God's biblical standard. So that's going to make it very clear. See, Israel is always the plumb line. Israel is always the dividing line. If there's not a love for Israel, if there's not a standing with Israel, then it's not going to be biblical. You don't even have to look at the rest of the tenets of an organization. If they don't love Israel and stand with Israel, you're going to find that the rest of it's not going to be biblical either. Because Israel is the starting place. That's where you start is with Israel. The Torah comes from Israel. The patriarchs, the matriarchs come from Israel. The Messiah comes from Israel. God set apart his people Israel to teach the rest of the world how to relate to him. So if there's not a connection to Israel, you're going to see anti-biblical tactics. You're going to see anti-biblical tenets and an anti-biblical foundation. And anything that's anti-biblical will not only destroy unity within the body of believers, but it will destroy this nation because the nation itself was founded on biblical principles. This was the importance of us writing the Declaration of Kingdom Standards for the United States of America and starting with our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and its Bill of Rights. We started there to, to really completely reveal that this nation and its founding documents come straight out of scripture and come with a scriptural undertone because without that when you remove it you don't just take god out of the nation you actually remove the foundation of the nation which causes the nation to be destroyed to self-destruct and in its place the enemy the enemy will raise up an entirely different system and i'm going to tell you right now there are multiple groups I told y'all that spirit of anti-Messiah or antichrist or the beast that you see in Revelation chapter 13, that spirit has seven heads. Seven is a number of completion, which means it's going to show up in multiple forms. I'm talking groups that would never talk to each other, all coming from this same principality and all having the same motive of destroying this nation. But here's the challenge. The scripture says in Daniel that this same spirit would seek to deceive the elect if it were possible, now God's people are speaking the same divisive rhetoric. God's people are, are, are giving that same language. They're even giving credence to many of these groups that, that say they're for this group and they're for that group. And sure, they care about somebody, but if you don't care about everybody, you're going to destroy the nation. If you don't care about everybody, starting with Israel. See, Dr. King understood that. That's why Dr. King was a lover of Israel. That's why Dr. King was a Zionist. And it's important that we understand that because you're not going to see everybody who follows behind him after those 50 years, after he dies, and then we see this 50 year time period before we get to now, you don't see everybody who continues his work actually having that same biblical foundation. Now I want to show you guys the evidence. Remember I told y'all we had articles and we had letters. I want to show them to you because I want you to really understand that Dr. King was serious about not just ministering to Israel and Jordan, because that wasn't his first motive. His first motive was to connect a plumb line from the civil rights movement in the United States back to Israel to really reconnect this nation to the kingdom of God as he established in the Israel and as he will reestablish it when our Messiah returns to rule the world in Jerusalem. See, Dr. King was so ahead of his time, not just in his strategies, but in his heart, in his vision for this nation. And it's essential that five decades later, we've got to rebuild upon that foundation and we've got to destroy every other false foundation that has reared its head, that has been erected by people, all these powers of Babel that have come forth that are divisive and destructive. So I want to take you guys to um, the, 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 the evidence that I shared with you about this move of God that Dr. King was planning 
prior to the Six Day War and his own assassination. And so this first thing that you're going to see, this is actually uh, a letter. This is a, a picture of the original letter on the Martin Luther King Holy Land Pilgrimage letterhead <laughs> that is written about this particular trip. He was planning on taking the trip, of course, in November of 1967. That didn't happen because the Six Day um, War, of course, occurred. Then he postponed it. And of course, we know he was, was assassinated in 1968. And so he never got to come back to this, which he was going to do in the following November. But you see this letter here that, that has come from this, this movement that he's created because he's creating this pilgrimage and inviting other Americans where he talks about that he's going to bring people from all these different backgrounds and faiths and races to come together and go into this pilgrimage in the land. Like it was such a beautiful uh, vision on Dr. King's heart. It was such a beautiful move of God that he was planning to see. And this is so beautiful. Um, this, is, this is actually a quote at the very end of it. You're going to see a quote from Dr. King. And it says, one of the most memorable occasions of my life was to visit the Holy Land and to see and feel the inspiring land from which our faith burst forth. Therefore, I count this a rare privilege in my ministry to lead this pilgrimage, and I am de delighted to officially accept these invitations. And the invitations were the invitations he was receiving from Israel and Jordan, and then also from leaders from all of these denominations, which you see in the paragraph just above that, who were saying they wanted to connect and they wanted to be involved. Now, the next thing I want to show you is an article that was written. And this article in the New York Times, what I thought was published May 16th, 1967 in the New York Times. This is the article. It says, Dr. King to lead fall pilgrimage to the Holy Land. This is the second set of evidence here that we were able to collect after we were told in Israel that Dr. King was planning to do this and that we had to pick up this drop baton of Dr. King. I was able to find these two pieces of evidence, these artif artifacts that were recorded. And this is so important because Literally, he's telling it. He's telling us, look at this. Says, the Israeli and Jordanian governments, he said, have promised their cooperation to make the pilgrimage a success. Like it's right there. And it's this is in 1967, you guys. Like, my goodness, look at what he was planning to do. And when you think about his assassination in 1968, so many people believe that there was there was some work that he was going to do with regard to some uh, um. Uh, some unfair practices. He was going to do some work with regard to, you know, labor uh, unions and, and things like that. And people like, that's why he was killed. But most people don't know he was planning this. And, and knowing the devil the way I know the devil, this is probably the thing he was most afraid of. The enemy was like, I, I can't let Dr. King um, go to Israel and Jordan with a whole bunch of Americans <laughs> and spouting peace and, and sharing the gospel and, and, and demonstrating and, you know, bringing back the Holy Spirit and then connecting this plumb line back to the United States. I can't allow this to happen. And it's so important that we understand that our God knows everything. He sees everything. He wasn't surprised about Dr. King's assassination. Dr. King wasn't surprised. The day before he was assassinated, he said he, he gave his, I've been to the mountaintop sermon. And in that sermon, he said he would love to get there with us. And longevity has its place, but he may not get there, but he has seen it. And so he knew that there were assassination attempts against him. He knew that there was a likelihood that he would probably die soon. I think the Lord had made him very aware of it. And so none of these things were surprised when it comes to the heavens looking down. It was an opportunity for us to actually pick up right where he left off. For 50 years, we have allowed this assignment to fall fallow. And we praise God. What a beautiful thing we've seen in this current administration, the movement of the, 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 uh, the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. We see the relationship between Israel and the United States being stronger than it has been in a really, really, really long time. Jews just blessing the United States. But after what happened on January 6th, I actually shared those articles with you guys, I think on Friday. Um, Israel is now afraid. Israel is concerned. But why? Because hate crimes are rising up. Um, white supremacists and white nationalist propaganda is rising up, which means anti-Semitism is also increasing. There's a concern among Jews now. Why? Because if we are divided, if we're divided as Americans, it doesn't matter what great things we do. If, if our house is divided, it can't stand. And our house is not standing. It is crumbling. And every enemy that can get in the crack is getting in the crack, which is not just bad news for America. It's bad news for Israel. And Israel is very well aware of that. 
And it's important that we understand it because we have done great things. But if we don't do great things God's way, the enemy still wins. And in these last four years, we have not done great things God's way. We've been in flesh. We've been divided. We've been polarized. We've been emotional. We have not been godly in our character. We've not been godly in the way we address ungodliness. We've either been quiet We've made excuses for it or we've been so enraged by it that we stopped praying and stopped speaking the truth in love. None of those extremes come from God. The middle path is for us to be consistent in the standard, no matter who is keeping it, no matter who is breaking it, to speak the truth in love, to say what is of God and to say what is not of God, not being polarized by political parties, not idolizing any political leaders. We've got to repent of it. So I want to encourage you to join us tomorrow for our National Kingdom Council gathering, the second gathering of the National Kingdom Council. And we're going to come together at 3 p.m. Eastern time via Zoom because we've got to continue the work of Dr. King. We've got to address the division, the resentment, the bitterness in this nation. We've got to address our soul condition. We've got to address the fact that we have been failing God and we've been failing the rest of our countrymen. Because the body of believers should be standing in unity, operating in peace and demonstrating love no matter what is happening around us. And we have become just like the rest of the nation, just as divided, just as polarized. We have got to allow God himself to cleanse us so he can put us back in our rightful positions, align us with the kingdom, and then send us out. Because that's what tomorrow's real focus is, for him to send us out armed with the Declaration of Kingdom Standards for the United States of America to actually share it with our elected officials and let them know that we will hold them accountable to those standards. And we're not holding them accountable to something we're not going to share with them. Not only are we going to share the declaration, but we're supposed to be in position to be godly counselors. If they have questions about the ways and will of God, we're supposed to be there to answer those questions. But we cannot do that in a united front as long as we're fighting amongst ourselves. And as long as we're fighting amongst ourselves, we're not bringing our prophetic pieces together to see the full revelation of God, and we're not sharpening each other's iron. Instead, the enemy is actually being victorious over all of us because we're divided. So I want to encourage you. Um, I think I'm going to share my screen again so that you can see very clearly where to go to. Go to nationalkingdomcouncil.org, and right here on the home page, it's going to tell you about reconvening the National Kingdom Council. Just subscribe to the email list right there. And when you do, you'll receive an email. I'm going to send the last email out tomorrow morning. So you want to make sure that you subscribe to the email list sometime prior to 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Eastern time, because that's when I'm going to send out the last email so that you can know how to join us, get the Zoom link, and also start to prepare. Because there's some things we got to do before we come together. We want to stand in God's divine counsel, get some healing, get some revelation, and then come together that we could approach his throne as one. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, we lift you up and we worship you, Lord God. And we just praise you even now for this mandate and this mantle that we do not deserve and for which we've not allowed ourselves to be prepared. But you know all things and you will cleanse us. You will minister to us. You will prepare us to do your work your way. We bless you. Hallelujah, Lord God, for your grace and favor to us, for your ministry unto us. And we confess that we have been judgmental. We've allowed ourselves to be divided. We've been polarized. And we have been operating in our own flesh and our emotion rather than submitting those to you that we can operate in your spirit and under your anointing. Forgive us, Lord God, for rejecting the model that you'd already set before us, for failing to continue the work that you'd already given us to do, but instead receiving new assignments and, and, and standing on soapboxes as if certain issues were more important to you than others. You care about everything and everyone. Help us, Lord God, to get it right in this season because 2021, this season we are in demands that we get it right. We have no more time to be immature. We have no more time to be divided. We've got to unite around your Holy Spirit, around your Holy Throne and be your kingdom ambassadors in the earth. We invite you, Lord God, to have your way in us. We invite you even now to go before us into the National Kingdom Council gathering tomorrow, Lord God, that you would prepare the way and that you would draw us, prepare us, that we would be your people even as you manifest yourself among us 
as our God. Be in the center of us, Lord God, and help us to gather and unite around your presence. We praise you for that even now. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen. Now, of course, I want to release the ironic blessing over you guys um, after having shared all of that. But it was so essential for where God is taking us. Know that you are his royal priest and he's the one who makes you worthy. Receive his name upon you. upon you. Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh shine his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May Yahweh look upon you and give you his shalom and give his Shalom. Yeshua Hamashiach. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you all. And I'll see you tomorrow night for our online healing service at 3 p.m. for our National Kingdom Council. Be blessed.